Redeemer Queens Park exists to help connect Jesus to people, people to community, and community to mission. And I just want to say welcome to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for dropping in on another Bible Talk in the Redeemer Queens Park community. So glad to have you with us today. I hope you're doing well in the midst of lockdown number three. You know it's been said that lockdown can make you a chunk, a hunk, a skunk, or a punk, or a drunk. So I hope you choose wisely, and I do hope everybody is keeping safe. Listen, there are a lot of good reasons not to believe in God for many people. We might call these reasons to not believe in God barriers to belief. And I want to share with you what I hope will be a really encouraging word for you this afternoon, whether you're a Christian or you're just trying to figure all of this stuff out, about barriers to belief, the different barriers to belief that we're all carrying consciously or unconsciously. You know, for some Christians, we'll develop different barriers to belief through seemingly unanswered prayers, through wondering why God allowed so much pain and suffering. For others, the, the reasons for these different barriers to belief, they become a little more involved. For some of us, we have trouble understanding how could a good and loving God allow for so much suffering in this world. For some of us, our, our reasons for unbelief in God, these barriers to belief, they go back to past hurts of our childhood. You know, it was Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche, Sigmund Freud, and Albert Camus who all had fathers that either abused them, abandoned them, or died in their childhood. And sometimes it's actually past hurts that lead us to a place where we just find it very, very difficult to believe in God. Listen, if you find it difficult to believe in God, I do hope you'll be encouraged by what we see in the Bible. I have an encouraging word with you this afternoon. It's from the Gospel of John. And listen, the entire Gospel of John was given to us so that we would be able to believe. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the key phrase for us today, these are written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's what we're after, friends. We're after believing in this Jesus and enjoying the life that He so freely offers. Well, let's just get into it then. John chapter 4, verses 43 to 45. Here in this verse, notice the phrase, Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Well, here we go. Jesus is returning to his homeland of Galilee after two days away in Samaria. And let me tell you, the time away in Samaria was a smashing success. You just read the previous couple of chapters that lead into what we have right here, and you'll see all the amazing stuff that has taken place. Well, some people were coming to Jesus, apparently according to Jesus, some people were coming to him in this moment for what they could get from him, not really for him himself. The action continues, John chapter 4, verses 46 and 50. Notice the phrase, there was a certain royal official. He went to Jesus and he begged him, and listen to what he says. He goes to Jesus and he says to him, would you come and would you heal my sick son? You have a father who's just traveled perhaps 15 miles, probably on foot from the coast of Capernaum over to Cana to meet this Jesus. Jesus says to him, unless people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. But look at the persistence of this loving father. He says, sir, come down before my child dies. And go, Jesus replied, for your son will live. And then we see this official took Jesus at his word. And he rolled out. He left. Consider what's going on here. In verse 43, Jesus left the place of Samaria for the place of Galilee. He left the place where he was being honored for a place where he wouldn't receive much honor. He traveled 10 miles north of where he was. And that put him 15 miles from the coast where we see this father out of concern for a sick child who's sick with fever, travels over to visit with Jesus and to seek Jesus's help. And Jesus is in a place where people are seeking him for all kinds of other reasons. They have these different barriers to belief in Jesus, their familiarity with Jesus. They're accustomed to Jesus. And here it goes. Jesus offers to move in and heal this father's son. John chapter 4, verses 51 to 53. We see that while he was still on the way, he encountered his servants. He inquired among them, when was my son healed? And we learn yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Now, amazingly, amazingly, this father took Jesus at his word and he left. He left. He's walking. 
And listen, something that's bugged me over the last week as I've been looking at this, I've been trying to figure out, why is it that these servants seem to have traveled for a day and a half before encountering this father? Well, maybe something about the father's pace tells him, tells us about something about the father's belief. The father appears to be walking at this leisurely pace, trusting that Jesus had in fact healed his son from 15 miles away. Well, that's why the servants were able to get to him and explain what happened just the day before. Well, then the, the whole point of the book of John happens in the next few verses. John chapter 4, verses 53 to 54. So he and his whole household believed. There are many barriers to belief in this encounter with Jesus, but look what happens in the end. The nobleman's house believes in Jesus. Can you imagine the journey of faith for this nobleman? As he had this spark of faith, as he walked those 15 miles, perhaps he was running on behalf of his son from Capernaum all the way over to Cana. Can you imagine his flame, the flame of his faith coming into action as he interacts with Jesus? And now look at the full conflagration of his faith as his whole family comes to believe in Jesus. Jesus, this amazing healer who can heal a sick child of fever from 15 miles out. Let's take a minute and just sit with this and allow the Lord to minister to us. So friends, we've considered this story of Jesus graciously heal healing the nobleman's son. We're starting to think about the different barriers to belief in Jesus that we all carry. And after this, we're going to consider how Jesus graciously works with us despite our many barriers to belief in Him. Notice just three of the many barriers to belief that you see right here in this encounter with Jesus. First, we see that familiarity with Jesus was a barrier to people being able to actually believe in Jesus. Think about it with me, friend. It was the fact that many people knew Jesus from childhood that made them think they knew who He was and what He was all about. Maybe that's one of the reasons why a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. When you think about the childhood exposure to Jesus, it makes me wonder. I wonder if there's anyone listening to this right now that actually has a barrier to belief in Jesus and it is exactly their supposed familiarity with Jesus. The fact that some of us went to Christian schools growing up, or the fact that some of us actually attended different chapels, or the fact that some of us actually even studied some of the books about Jesus, that familiarity with Jesus might actually be the thing that keeps us from meeting Jesus. There's a massive difference between going to Jesus for who He really is and going to Him for who we think He is. Those barriers to belief or many, but notice the next one, this sign seeking versus savior seeking. It's the second barrier to belief that you see in this encounter. The hometown crew wanted signs from Jesus, but they didn't run a soul savior. So think about it. Even the nobleman came to Jesus to heal his son, but not to receive anything in and of himself for himself. A serious barrier to belief is the fact that we may want things from Jesus without actually wanting Jesus himself. Many people encounter signs about Jesus, but those signs are no guarantee that we've met the real Jesus in the end. What about you? Do you find yourself to be someone that when you think about God, you think about what you could get from Him and not really who He is in and of Himself and whether He is worthy of your time and attention at all? You see, there are some people that simply want signs, but they really don't care who God is or what's on offer with Him. There's a massive difference between the two. Finally, look at the third barrier to belief that you see in this encounter with Jesus. It's pride. It's the most obvious and it's the most menacing of all the barriers to belief. The root problem is our fallen capacity to be able to look away from ourselves and look to another. The Bible clearly calls our pride sin for many reasons. We will accept gifts that benefit us, and we have a way of not caring about things at all if it doesn't look like it could directly benefit us in our own lives. We are concerned for things that will heal us 
or will profit us and our families in some ways, but a divine revelation, a divine sign that discloses who we really are and who God really is, well, that can be tough to get in touch with. Now, John here is like a Rembrandt. He provides us with this amazingly clear and luminous portrait of Jesus in order to help us see Jesus and believe in Him. Divine signs are like light. They are painful since they disclose everything that is hidden in the dark. So let's just take a moment and consider the different barriers to belief that get lit up by this divine sign that we see here. So friends, we began our time by considering this encounter between Jesus and the nobleman. Then we considered the different barriers to belief that we all carry. Now let's conclude our time by considering this Jesus, the one who is not only worthy of our worship, but the one who makes belief in him possible. Let's consider the barrier overcoming belief generating Savior that we see right here. Notice three things. First thing, notice the power of Jesus. Jesus is powerful. Jesus doesn't need to leave the hills of Cana in order to do a healing on the coast in Capernaum. He can say a word or think a thought and his words can shoot 15 miles across the countryside and to provide a healing there. Who else do you know that has this kind of power? Who else do you know that can say a single thing and 15 miles away it is done? Oh, He is powerful. His Word immediately gives life in the present tense, and that's the promise of the Gospel. Jesus is powerful. See Him. Believe in Him and ask Him to powerfully work in your life, and I think you'll be surprised in the ways that He does. Second, notice this. is Jesus who gives faith. Jesus gives faith. This long-distance healing invites us to trust in Jesus by faith. You see, faith is all over this story. Faith was at work in the heart of a father as he made the 15-mile journey from the coast into the hills. Faith was at work in him as he stood face to face with the Savior of the world. And faith swept his home. This man is able to endure. The question for you and me is, do we have this kind of faith? Well, it's Jesus who gives this faith, so go to Him. Like a father, we only need to go to Jesus as well and to share with Him what we need. And as we share, He gives to us not simply what we ask for, He gives to us everything we would have asked for if we knew everything that He knows about us in our situation. Endure some time and endure some conversation with Jesus, and you will find Jesus giving you faith in your own life. And all of this is possible. Every bit of it is possible because Jesus is gracious. Oh, He's powerful. Oh, He gives faith. But it's all rooted and based in this one thing. He's gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us the gift of Himself. So notice here the grace of Jesus. It's all sourced in the fact that He is more loving than we are sinful. He has more goodness in Him than we could ever have dysfunction and barriers in our own lives. Our sin is no match for His grace. Our stubbornness is no match for His sovereignty. And when you think about it and get all the way down to it, our barriers are really never big enough to keep out His blessing if He chooses to be kind and come towards us in faith. So taken together, these two miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, they reveal the heart of Jesus. A heart that is so eager to come into a wedding to be sure the party never dies out, and yet who listens to the concerns of a broken and hurting father. Behold, the all-encompassing compassion of Jesus While we have many barriers to belief, He is the one that makes belief possible. So see Him, behold Him, believe in Him, and enjoy the life that He offers.